1996, Resident Evil 1 was a monument for the PlayStation 1 and managed to be successful both critically and commercially. It would become one of Capcom's most popular franchises and even had numerous re-releases and ports to follow in a small amount of time. Despite this though, the game doesn't seem to be as highly regarded nowadays compared to the next game to be released. Less than two years later, Capcom developed and released Resident Evil 2 in January of 1998 and was met with much stronger reviews around the time and sold exceptionally well. Resident Evil 1 might have given survival horror some form of notoriety, but Resident Evil 2 would pave the way for the survival horror genre in general influencing other future horror games and ended up becoming one of the greatest video games of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, join me as we make our escape through Raccoon City and unlock the truth behind the cause of this infested outbreak. This is Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2 entered development only one month after the release of Resident Evil 1 and was developed by a team consisting of only 45 people. This development team would later be known as Capcom Production Studio 4, including Hideki Kamiya, the same man who directed the first Devil May Cry, Beautiful Joe, and Okami. This new team was also done by a new group of people in the studio alongside with only half the members who worked on the original Resident Evil 1. A lot of people are also wondering themselves, what about Shinji Mikami? Well, he was still serving as the producer for the game, but he did have creative disagreements with Hideki Kamiya and even tried to influence the team with his own direction. However, he originally withdrew his role as a producer and only requested a new build up of the game once a month. At the same time, the original version of the game, which was called Resident Evil 1.5 at the time, was already being shown off and was initially planned for a May of 1997 release. The original version was going to feature two new main characters, Leon S. Kennedy, a rookie cop who's starting his first day at the Raccoon City Police Department, and another character named Elsa Walker, a college student and motorcycle racer who would later be scrapped in favor of making a new character named Claire Redfield, who was Chris Redfield's younger sister. Initially in the 1.5 version, while their stories were mostly similar to the final product, Leon and Elsa were not going to cross paths at all throughout the entire game. Leon was going to receive help from Marvin Brana and researcher Linda, who would later become Ada Wong in the final product. Elsa was going to be aided by Sherry Birkin and a character named John, who would later become Kendo, the gun shop owner in the final version as well. Resi 1.5 was going along fairly well. It was about 60 to 80% complete and was almost close to reaching its scheduled release date. Then one day, Mikami thought the game wouldn't be able to reach the quality in time and found the gameplay and locations to be dull and boring. So what does he do? He decided to have the team start again all the way from the beginning. There were tons of changes during the restart. Yoshi Okamoto, the producer of the first RE game, found the plot of 1.5 to be too conclusive and thought it would be better to alter it to expand on a potential universe. Originally, 1.5 wasn't fully connected with the first Resident Evil game, which might explain why there aren't that many relations to it initially. However, Okamoto was introduced by Noboru Shugimura, the writer for tokusatsu's shows such as Mecha Hero and some of the Super Sentai series as well. Shugimura was a huge fan of the first game's story and wanted to find a way to have the sequel be connected to it. Thus, Elsa Walker would later become Claire Redfield in the final build of the game. And from there, Resident Evil 2 was back in development. To compensate for the delay, Capcom decided to re-release the first Resident Evil with the director's cut version as an apology. And as an added bonus, a demo disc for Resident Evil 2 was included as well. It's only about 20 minutes long and you only play as Leon in the demo, but for the most part, everything remains the same, except in the end when Ada shoots at Leon before concluding the demo. Resident Evil 2 would finally come out in January of 1998 for the PS1 with unanimous critical praise and high sales eventually becoming the fastest selling video game in North America and broke sales records of video games such as Final Fantasy 7 and Super Mario 64. But how did it happen exactly? What was it about Resident Evil 2 that made everyone want to play it? True, it was a huge improvement over the first game, but I don't think anyone would have thought that this game would be breaking sales records. Well, only one way to find out. Let's take a look at Resident Evil 2. Two months have passed since the first Resident Evil game. The remaining members of Stars featuring Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Barry Burden, and Rebecca Chambers made it back to the Raccoon City Police Department safe and sound. Oh, so did Brad. 
Thank God. I hope nothing bad happens to them in the future. They began to investigate Umbrella, a pharmaceutical company from the first game, and tried to warn the RCPD that they were the ones who caused the outbreak. But unfortunately, with no evidence to back it up since the mansion went boom louder than a POD song, no one would believe them. Alongside Umbrella themselves, bribing the police chief Brian Irons to keep his mouth shut, disbanding stars as a whole, and even putting Chris under surveillance. Despite this, Chris himself got some new information about the T-Virus and started to suspect Chief Irons' corruption. He would even get the FBI to have an internal investigation on Irons and the T-Virus while he and Barry head over to Europe to go on vacation. And by vacation, I mean assaulting a police officer and getting suspended and going to Europe to investigate Umbrella's HQ. However, that scenario will be for another day. For now, we have to take the trip back over to Raccoon City. We're introduced to two new characters, Leon S. Kennedy, a rookie police officer on his way to begin his first day on the job, and Claire Redfield, a college student who's heading to the city to look for her brother Chris. The two eventually meet up, explaining their current roles before being jump-scared by a zombie in the back of a cop car. A truck drives by and crashes into the cop car, leading it to explode and separating the two. Now, from here, Resident Evil 2 has two different scenarios. Scenarios. Well, technically four scenarios, but only two of them are canonical. Resident Evil 2 lets you have the option to try out which scenario you want to start with first. If you pick Leon, you do Leon scenarios first, followed by Claire. This is referred to as Leon A and Claire B. But if you pick Claire scenario, you get to do Claire A and Leon B. The latter is considered to be canonical, so from there, I'll be going from the Claire A and Leon B story for now. Claire runs away from the flaming cop car and heads inside a gun shop. She meets the owner, Kendo, who almost mistakes her for a zombie. Whew, <laughs> thankfully she wasn't around for the Willamette outbreak. Cletus is not as friendly as Kendo is. As she cuts through the gun store, Kendo gets mauled by zombies and heads into the police station. She finds a bloodied officer named Marvin who's wounded. She's asking if he's seen or heard of Chris, but Marvin revealed that Chris and the other SARS members disappeared after the mansion incident. He even gives Claire a key card to unlock the other doors in the station. While exploring the station, she finds a little girl who runs away after encountering a zombie. She then meets up with Leon and gives Claire a radio to keep in contact with each other. After exploring some more, she runs into Chief Irons, who also mistakes her for a zombie, followed by running into the little girl again whose name is Sherry Birkin, who was told to run off to the police station. Claire, however, suggests that staying at the station is also dangerous and offers Sherry to come. Sherry doesn't want to go, though, because of a giant monster that's looking for her and runs away when she hears the sound. Claire chases and finds Sherry again and still offers her to follow Claire. Sherry once again refuses though and tries to find her father who she thinks is under attack. After exploring some more, she finds Chief Irons inside his own hideout. Irons points a gun at her and threatens her as well, blaming Umbrella and revealing that he was secretly working with Umbrella the entire time, and knowing about the new virus called the G-Virus, a virus turning a human into an ultimate bioweapon. He even reveals that he was poisoned as a way for Umbrella to cover up their tracks. Irons is about to take Claire out with him before getting killed by a small mutant inside of him a la alien style, and Claire and Sherry head down to the sewers, noticing that the monster is following them. As they make their way down into the sewers, Claire and Sherry are separated yet again. As as Claire is looking for Sherry, she meets Annette Birkin, Sherry's mother. She explains that the monster going after Sherry is actually William Birkin, Sherry's father, and says that the chaos happening right now is all because of him. We get a flashback where William is making the G-Virus before getting caught by Umbrella. One of the members of Umbrella starts shooting him, leaving him wounded, and collects the sample. Annette comes to help him, but William injects the G-Virus in himself. Now as a monster, he attacks all the remaining Umbrella soldiers and injects himself to the G-Virus even more, leaving the rats to carry the remaining samples and leaving it to be transported over to the city. Claire reunites with Sherry, but finds out that Sherry is implanted with an embryo to produce a legitimate offspring. A fight with William later, Claire is able to escort Sherry to a safe room. Claire tries to find a cure for Sherry, but Annette blames Claire for killing William. She makes a sample of the G-Virus and tries to take it for herself, but Claire tries to talk some sense into Annette, however, saying that William implanted an embryo inside Sherry. Annette later finds out that William is alive, but gets attacked by him. During her last breath, Annette gives Claire notes on how to make a vaccine for the G-Virus. Claire makes the vaccine and is about to give it to Sherry before we get one more fight against William, who is now fully transformed into a monster. Claire defeats him though and runs to the train even noticing Leon is already on board. And she finally gives the vaccine to Sherry and they both have a moment where they hug. 
Leon then says it's all over, but Claire signifies that it's not because she still needs to find Chris, thus closing the books for Claire's story. But that's only one half of the game's main story. What about Leon? What exactly was he doing while all of this is happening? While the situation with Claire was going on, Leon was currently dealing with his own situation. Leon is on the opposite side of the cop car and also heads down towards the RCPD building. However, a tyrant called a T-00 shows up and starts to hunt Leon. Get used to him because you're going to be seeing him for the whole entire scenario. He runs away and finds Sherry, but Sherry runs off and crawls inside a wooden door. We then get an interaction with Claire that plays out the same way as it was in Claire A, with Leon giving Claire a radio. As he makes his way into the RCPD garage, he meets Ada Wong. If the name Ada sounds familiar, well that's because it's the same Ada as one of the notes from the first Resident Evil game that was written by someone named John. Ada is looking for a reporter named Ben who was doing some investigation about the bizarre murders in the city's outskirts. We find Ben locked up in a jail cell, assuming for his own safety. You'll find out why it won't work later. Ada asks Ben about what they told the city about the outbreak, even admitting that she's looking for John, who could have possibly arrived in the city from Chicago. Ben then later claims that there's something else besides zombies roaming around the building. Leon still gives Ben the offer to join him, but Ben refuses and gives Leon a shortcut instead to the sewers. After some more puzzles, Leon hears Ben getting attacked by a monster who looks like William Birkin. Leon and Ada head off to the chemical plant and find Annette Birkin. Annette runs away and Ada follows her. Annette starts shooting at her, but Leon throws himself to take the bullet with Ada following Annette again. Annette points a gun at Ada and talks about the same situation that was discovered in Claire A's scenario. She then notices a pendant on Ada's neck and looks similar to the pendant that Sherry has. The two fight, but Ada knocks Annette off the balcony. As she opens the pendant, she finds a sample of the G-Virus underneath it. Back to Leon, he finds Ada but is badly wounded. Ada tends to his wounds, they both head to the monorail, but Ada gets wounded by William and Leon has a boss fight against William. As he tries to find more information about the situation, Leon gets interrupted by Annette who claims that Ada is only looking for John as only a means to get information about Umbrella as Ada is a spy to steal the G-Virus and to give it to an unknown assailant. As she's about to shoot Leon, the tyrant shows up and you have another fight with him. However, they meet up again only for Ada to save him by sacrificing herself. Leon and Ada have one final moment with Ada wanting Leon to leave without her. They both kiss before Ada dies inside Leon's arm, leaving Leon to be distraught. Ada. No. Ada! A self-destruction sequence begins and Leon gets in contact with Claire. Claire tells Leon to bring Sherry to the emergency car and before he starts the ride, we have one more fight with the tyrant. Leon grabs the rocket launcher, says something really silly and corny. Game over and blows the tyrant sky high. He heads back to the emergency car and starts it, leading to the same scene where Claire jumps into the car. However, this is far from the end. We head back to the end of the car and see William Birkin one more time, fully transformed into this crazy ass design of a monster. Leon kills him momentarily, but William follows all the way to the front of the car. Sherry activates the self-destruction button and all three of them escape from the car with William blowing up with it. The remaining three survivors head off into the sunrise and Leon ends with saying they're going to take out Umbrella, thus putting an end to Resident Evil 2. Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. Resi 2's campaign is much better than Resi 1's campaign by a landslide. I thought Leon and Claire were much more fleshed out in this game compared to Chris and Jill, and I also welcomed the additional characters like Sherry and Ada as well. I have always appreciated the relationship between Claire and Sherry. Since Sherry was an only child, she never had anyone to hang out with, not even her own parents since they were too busy working with Umbrella. However, upon meeting Claire, they tend to get along just fine very quickly, and Claire always looks out for Sherry like a big sister, little sister kind of relationship. And Leon and Ada's relationship worked wonders, since Ada and Leon care for each other as well, but with a more romantic-like relationship, especially towards the end with Ada and Leon kissing. It's a better form of chemistry compared to, say, Barry and Jill, with Barry saying that Jill was almost a sandwich, and Chris and Rebecca with Rebecca playing music and making an antidote because Chris is, well, 
everybody hates Chris. But it's not just that as well. In terms of the presentation, it's also a step up. Although we no longer have the cheesy live action FMVs and more, which depending on who you are is either an improvement or a downgrade, the CGI cutscenes that replace them are pretty solid, especially for a PS1 game. And the voice acting, although still not that great in some certain aspects, is also an improvement as well. Leon's voice actor played by the late Paul Haddad did a great job as Leon. Fun fact, he also played as Quicksilver in the 90s X-Men cartoon, so that's a nice little fun fact. It's unfortunate though that he passed away in 2020. He deserves all the credit for his performance in the game, and is easily my favorite voice of Leon next to the actor who, ironically, played as him in the remake. And it's not just the voice either. Leon's personality as a rookie cop always following the rules despite the situation going on is very charming and also kind of hilarious. Especially when he shows up in later RE games where his personality just goes from always being serious and following the rules to being a wisecracking doofus in Resident Evil 4. I always prefer Claire more compared to her older brother as well. While true, she sounds almost as robotic as her brother and also a bit creepy in some certain cases too, no I am not playing that scene where she giggles at Sherry, everyone has already played that clip countless amount of times, but she is capable of handling herself much better. She's more intelligent, she can also lockpick like Jill can in RE1, and she can also blow up a monster while saying some corny ass line. You lose, big guy. I think both Leon and Claire are great characters all around, and it's also not just from the story and presentation perspective either, but also from the gameplay perspective as well. Both Leon and Claire play equally to one another. They can both carry up to 8 items in contrast to Jill and Chris in Resident Evil 1. They both control similarly as the game once again uses tank controls, and even have a system called a zapping system, meaning that the characters are confronted with different puzzles, enemies, and plot points. For example, when you finish a character's A scenario, events from the A scenario can be carried into the other character's B scenario. Another example, when you're doing Claire's A scenario, you collect the side pack that increases your inventory from 8 to 10. And if you choose to leave the submachine gun, Leon in his B scenario can use it instead. It's a unique and clever way to increase replayability as it encourages the player to do all four playthroughs to see these outcomes. That being said, the gameplay is still Resident Evil, meaning tank controls, constant backtracking, fixed camera angles that messes with your view, and limited inventory. Even if it's an improvement over the first game, it still may not be everyone's cup of tea. Personally, I think it's better than the first game, but nothing has changed drastically all that much gameplay-wise either. Even in this game, you can play as a character support character like Sherry for Claire or Ada for Leon. At the end of the scenarios, you're ranked depending on your performance, like how many times you've saved, how fast you finished the scenario, or how many special healing items you've used. You even unlock new costumes, weapons, and new game modes, including Extreme Battle Mode, a game mode that would be the prototype for Mercenaries mode in future Resident Evil games. You could play as Leon, Claire, Ada, or even Chris Redfield from RE1. Extreme Battle Mode is a game mode where all you have to do is just survive a long gauntlet of enemies with very limited ammunition. There's nothing else to it really, but it is a nice little fun distraction. Now, I am not an expert in Resident Evil, so I didn't unlock everything, and even though I enjoyed this game, I am not replaying these scenarios again to unlock everything. I mean, I am incredibly burnt out from playing this game four times now. Maybe in a future livestream on Twitch that you should all follow since I am casually streaming on there more often. Whoops! <laughs> Where did that plug come from? Resident Evil 2 truly shaped up the horror genre in video games. Its story is more fleshed out, the characters are better written, and the gameplay wise, while still carrying some of the same faults as the first game, is still an improvement. This is honestly the best in the PS1 trilogy. But there were also multiple ports for the game as well. There was one for the N64, Dreamcast, GameCube, PC, and this thing called game.com or, or gamecom I, I have no idea what this thing is called but here's the gameplay for that version of resi 2 it looks bad but now it leads to the next question what's next for resident evil since re2 sold so well that meant a third game was already on the horizon but i don't think we were expecting one very quickly while the situation with Claire and Leon was happening in RE2, there was something else going on around the same time, and also featuring a familiar face as well. Next time we meet, we're heading back to Raccoon City and getting to play as Jill Valentine yet again. The survival horror continues in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis.
Thank you all for watching today's video. And before I conclude this video, I do want to go ahead and give out a little bit of announcement. I'm currently streaming on Twitch more often, so if you want to go ahead and see me play video games for a living all the time, then feel free to go ahead and follow that Twitch account as well. Or if you want to go ahead and watch the full streams on my YouTube channel, I also have a VOD account as well. Again, please feel free to go ahead and subscribe if you like my content, and make sure to like and subscribe to this channel if you want to see me talk about Resident Evil more often. Thanks so much for watching today's video, and I will see you guys later.